Oh, welcome to Knox Vintage Records, Noxion 68 uh, auction highlights reel. Like last time, we're going to go through a bunch of records. I'm just going to show you some labels and some of the more interesting things in the auction. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on each label because uh, we got a lot of stuff to look at. We're going to look at a little bit more than we did in the uh, 67 highlights reel. So let's get started. As usual in our auction catalogs, and I'll go ahead and show you what we're talking about this time. This is auction number 68. Uh, as usual, this has between nine and 10,000 records in it, 78 RPM and cylinder records. So this is an auction that actually closes September the 19th, though we will accept bids from you up until uh, probably September 17th, which I, or, uh, not night, uh, 17th, but uh, the Thursday after the 19th, which would be uh, the 24th. So we will take bids through Thursday the 24th. Uh, anything after that, we're not going to be able to count, however. Please don't wait until the last minute. If you can get your bids in uh, by uh, September 19th, which is Saturday or earlier, that would be very much appreciated. So each one of our catalogs starts off with a section of Berliners. And uh, some of you fellas may have never seen a Berliner or don't know what that is. We've got a lot of customers on our uh, mailing list who are new. And uh, some of this stuff may be unfamiliar. So this is a 7-inch Berliner record. Emil Berliner basically was the uh, developer of the disc uh, phonograph. Started working on it in the late 1880s. These Berliner 7-inch records were made generally between 1894 and uh, 1900 in the United States. They are single-sided, and you see that uh, there's no label on it. Backside generally completely blank. All the information is uh, uh, in the uh, uh, shellac itself, or hard rubber as the case may be, depending on when the record was made. So they're seven inch records, very primitive looking. I'm just showing you this one, which is lot number three, to give you an idea of what a Berliner should look like. But uh, because these were so primitive and uh, done so early, uh, things were not all that standardized. So here's a Berliner with no label information at all. All we have is the uh, title, artist, and number down at the bottom. Now sometimes these, these were done after the fact by a, a Zonophone company that was taking regular Berliner issues and pirating them by removing the information. That's not what this is. This is a, an actual Berliner recording that just lacks the label information. Here's one that's very interesting. So here we have the title information and so forth as usual at the bottom but the label is upside down. Not a lot of quality control. That, was, that one was made in 1896. Here's one where we have the title information and the label reversed positions. So we have title and artist at top, label name at the bottom. So that's one of the things that makes collecting Berliners so much fun. You just never know what you're going to run across. And then this is an interesting record. I really don't know that much about it. You'll see that you'll see uh, the Berliner uh, information behind this gold label, and it appears that the gold label has been applied by uh, the end user. This didn't come from the factory this way. In fact, you see this little indent indentation here, which is a little hole, that is made to accommodate the drive pin on a Zonophone front mount uh, phonograph, which uh, that pin would fit in that hole to keep the record from slipping as it's playing. And so the uh, paper label was applied across that hole as well. But I found this interesting. It's, I don't know if you can see that or not, Jack. By the way, we have uh, Jack Garrison on the camera. Hello. He is uh, going to be my assistant today, but uh, this is uh, the information up here appears to be stamped Joseph Bear from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and it says 10 days return to Avenue something or other. So I don't know if Joseph was running his own little uh, record library out of his home or what, but anyway, it's just, just a curious little artifact. Before we get to the label sections, we're going to breeze through a couple of other things right quick. We have a uh, 
Jack, if I put these here like this and just flip them, do you think that the uh, I think that would focus be great. will no that would just be that would be terrific. Okay, so this is a section of uh, uh, movie uh, lobby promos, and you're going to find that section on page fourteen. These are all pressed by Columbia, uh, all ten inch records. The artists involved in the uh, music are not the, the ones that would appear in a movie. In fact, uh, uh, these are generally just regular uh, Columbia recordings, uh, oftentimes on the Harmony label of series, Harmony, Velvetone, Diva. But, uh, but they do appear with these interesting movie label, uh, movie promo labels. So that's one type, the special record here at the bottom, which is actually the very first type that you find. And then you'll find your MGMs, which can be a colored MGM label with a lion or a black and gold MGM label. And then you will find a Publix label. And this is uh, kind of an interesting one. This is Uncle Don's Radio Club. It's in the same series as the uh, lobby promos, but obviously, obviously it's a radio thing. All right, now we've got a section in the catalog which feature Bing Crosby uh, tests and special pressings uh, done by DECA. That's on page 13 starting with lot number 866. Now I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of those so you'll have an idea. Uh, we've got two of these in the catalog which are very interesting. These are uh, actually uh, DECA pressings, single-sided, and they just uh, overlaid it with a uh, V-disc label. I don't know why. Uh, there are two of them. It's the same. I think it's the same label on each one. And it's not the inform It's not the actual recording in the grooves. Uh, but it's just uh, just another weird thing. Here is a very interesting uh, Deca uh, record from that particular series or uh, section in the catalog. Really nice colored wax. Uh, DECA didn't generally press records like this. This would have been done for some promo or advertising kind of a situation. Here's another one, red and black. A little bit more spectacular on this side, but someone had this hanging on the wall, so the uh, label on this side is a little bit faded. But still, a very, very nice, very interesting recording. You'll find these occasionally, uh, other labels. Uh, RCA Victor uh, will do that as well. Um, Here's another one of those Bing Crosby DECAs, but this is a more traditional DECA test pressing label which has been filled in. You'll see a couple of different uh, writing styles on here, one of which would, like the, the blue here, that would have been original when the record was pressed, and then somebody else wrote in the information later. Those DECA pressings, I should mention, are recordings which... Um, probably came out of Bing Crosby's personal collection. I got those from a guy in uh, San Francisco who was a big personality collector and he had attended Butterfield's auction uh, probably around 1983 or 84, somewhere there, when uh, the Bing Crosby estate was being sold. And uh, there were a lot of records in there that uh, were Bing's personal recordings and a lot of special pressings and test pressings. And, uh, and he was at that auction. He bought a lot of material. And I think that that's where this stuff came from. So here, for instance, is a very, very rare record. I have no idea how many would have been pressed, but this is a special uh, recording of a song written by uh, Jimmy Van Heusen and uh, John Burke. Uh, dedicated to the 5th Marines and uh, uh, let's see, General Rocky. So uh, there's a special little introduction by Bing Crosby before he uh, sings the song with uh, Van Heusen on the piano backing him up. Uh, you know, obviously never issued. Very, very rare. This is a record that actually was issued, the Freedom Train, but this is a special label. It says, for the personal use of the Honorable Tom C. Clark, Attorney General of the United States. Why Mr. Clark would have needed a personal copy of this record, I don't know, but here they pressed up a nice red, white, and blue copy for him. I've never seen that before. Uh, this is something out of our historical section, uh, just an interesting recording. This is uh, another kind of a special pressing. This would not have been sold, 
but this is President Hoover's address on welfare and relief mobilization broadcast from Fortress Monroe, Virginia, October 18th, 1931. It says here, awarded to some, uh, some individual, he didn't fill out in a name on this particular copy, in recognition of distinguished service in the welfare and relief mobilization of 1931-32. And this is a record I, I pulled out to show that uh, because it's just a fantastic record. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, you might uh, you might do a little bit of investigation and see if you can hear it on YouTube or uh, or bid on this particular copy. This is uh, the gas shell bombardment record, which was done uh, during World War One, where they actually took recording equipment to the front lines, and you will hear. Uh, uh, the sound of armament, armament uh, bombs, you know, flying overhead and so forth, whistling past. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting record, and we have played that on a bitter request show in the past, so that will not be on the bitter request show in this particular auction. Let me go through a few of these. We have a section of uh, flexible records. Uh, Typically, those are going to be hit of the weeks. I don't know. I don't think we have any hit of the weeks in this particular auction, uh, or other durium pressings, which are the same kind of a cardboard-backed uh, recording, single-sided recording. But uh, we do have some uh, oddball things from foreign countries, and we have a few uh, Marconi's as well. So, I'm just going to show some of these uh, because these are unusual foreign labels that you may not be familiar with. Here's the. Duophone Unbreakable Record, there were several different label varieties of this. You see the, the lion uh, Im, imparting a big edge chip to that particular record. Reminds me of my cat at home. Yeah, 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 yeah. well, Jack, you need, taste to, do, for need to do something about that, mm -hmm. but I don't know if Kelsey would. Uh... So here's a Filmophone. Filmophones are flexible. I don't know if you can see, but that's a kind of a bluish record. Uh, probably looks black from the camera. You got translucent blue. Here's uh, another film of phone, which is green. Can you see that, Jack? Mm -hmm. Is it green? Uh, a lot of times these records have very small spindle holes. They probably weren't, well, they were pressed that way a little bit just so that they would grab onto the spindle uh, and not slip when you're playing a record. But I think they've also shrunk over the years, which makes them very difficult to get on. And a lot of times you'll find that the spindle holes have little cracks as you as there are in this case. So here's a nice yellow one. Goodson was a company that uh, out of England that also produced a flexible record, and uh, these were, I mean, the record the way the record is obviously is a a picture disc, but they also did some of these with pictures of other things and so forth on them, especially for advertising purposes. Here's a Pathé cello disc. This is, uh, this is black, it's not translucent. A lot of times these kinds of records will get this rippled effect, again, because they shrink over uh, time and can be very, very difficult to play. You have to play that very slowly and then uh, digitally speed it up. Here's another Pathé Cello disc, which is a little bit flatter, and actually this will track and uh, has the original little Pathé Cello disc sleeve that came with it, which is not something you're always going to see, especially given the fact that these are uh, obviously very delicate. Yeah, be gentle with it, Kurt. Trying to get that back in there, Jack. Well, messing it up. All right. Yet another. What is this? Okay, we've got a couple of these. These are phony cords. All right. Pretty much like the same thing as the film of phone. Here's another one in yellow, which actually is a bonus. Whoever would be getting this record, uh, the red one, which is what they would be bidding on, would find that when they got their record in the mail, it had a little bonus with it. Here's a color it. In this case, color it green. Here's another color it, which is blue. You can see these are really pretty records, but they don't usually play terribly well. Here's an American Unity record. These were made by the same outfit that did uh, New Flexo, later became Flexo. 
Here is a uh, Marconi. These were done by Columbia around 1907. They are single sided with the Marconi Velvetone record label on the back. All right, there are actually two different styles of this. I don't know if I've got both of the label varieties here in this uh, little run of them or not, but they have to do with Marconi's hairline. We'll flip through right quick and see. These all look like they're the same. They are. But this, this one is interesting. The Mexican series of Marconi's, for whatever reason, were not single-sided. They were two-sided. Del tono perfecto. So and it comes with a matching Mexican series sleeve, too. Which uh, the Mexican series are tough to find, and the sleeves are even tougher. So there you have that. Here you can see Marconi with very little hair. Whereas on the labels, the later labels, they gave him a little bit more hair. It's a minor variation, but kind of interesting. I doubt uh, Marconi ever would have thought that 100 years later they'd be talking about his hairline. All right, so that goes gets us through a couple of the earlier sections in the catalog. We're going to bypass the Vogue picture records. Those are fairly common and... No doubt you know what those look like. Here is an interesting uh, uh, couple of records that I have. I believe we have an instructional section in the catalog. If we don't, I don't know where these would have come out of. But uh, this is a uh, obviously a Victor Scroll pressing, two record set called Instruments of the Orchestra, parts one through four. This is part one, strings. Uh, and, it, and it just lists uh, different uh, little tracks of each different stringed instrument and what they sound like. So this would have been used in the school. Nice. Uh, th those records actually turn up fairly common, but what doesn't turn up very common are the classroom posters that go with it. Okay, Jack, do you need me to back up? No, you got it. You got the whole thing? Yep. Oh, very good. J Jack, is a, he's a whiz on the camera, i got to say. All right, so here we have... Uh, I try not to, but... Yeah, okay, be, watch that, would you? The Instruments of the Orchestra by Sight, Sound, and Story, RCA Manufacturing Company. So this is chart number one, Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra pictured. So here we have... The flute and the piccolo. The flute and the piccolo. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Appreciate that. And like an oboe. a nice oboe, yeah. So each one of them have a picture of the artist down there. Bassoon. Bassoon. Thank you, Jackson. Oh, man, what could this be? Oh, oh, it fits out here. Can't leave that out. Mm -mm. That's uh, Brian's instrument. Clarinet. There we go. So anyway, when these do turn up, they're generally not a complete set, and they're usually kind of messed up as well. But you can see these are very nice. They don't have stains, they don't have tears. They're all in uh, really good condition. Might as well just go ahead and flip through the rest of these while we're going. Jack comes in here on Saturdays and practices his trombone. Yeah, I would need these cards or else I'd be lost without them. <laughs> and on the backs, you have the name of the instrument. So, some lucky bidder will win, wind up with uh, that set. Not only do we have the posters, but we actually have the original uh, envelope they came in. 20 charts of the instruments of the orchestra with handbook. I do not have the handbook. Oh. Had to be something. But if I have the hand, if I find the handbook, I'll let you know. Okay. Now we are going to look at we'll look at some of the special sleeves that are in the auction. So these are records which uh, we typically sell without sleeves. So here is a uh, red G&T of uh, Caruso recording. 
but the sleeve is what sets this apart. It's the original sleeve for the recording, Iris. Nice picture of Caruso on it. And a lot of times they will have information written back here around the uh, flap as well. That one does not. The next one I'm going to show you is a Melba recording, which unfortunately the sleeve on it is not as... as the sleeve is in good shape, but the, the, the printing is just badly faded. First let's look at the label, because it's interesting. This is a special... Uh, Melba label would have uh, appeared in the same uh, format with the same uh, recording angel at the top and wording as the Caruso we just looked at, but this one is a special re uh, pressing. It says, made for Madame Melba. The profits of the sale of this record are devoted to the fund for the unemployed inaugurated by uh, Her Majesty Queen Alexandra. God save the king, sung by Madame Melba special gramophone record, in fact. And this is the original sleeve for this record. And most of that information is actually printed here, and if you get it in the right light, you can read that, but it's very difficult. But you do have this really nice full-length picture of uh, Melba. So that's a very rare record and sleeve. We uh, sold a copy of that in a previous auction, and I think it went for around $500. Here is a recording by Tamaño. Uh, your Tamaño recordings, well, for instance, back up a moment, the uh, Melba recordings that we just looked at had that uh, kind of a mauve colored label. Uh, um, Tamaño didn't get a special label color. Instead, all of his records had a serial number, so your uh, U.S. Uh, Tamaño records were stamped with this gold serial number on them as a way to keep track of the copies sold, so he'd be sure to get his, uh, his uh, royalties. Uh, on the gramophone company pressings, or gramophone limited pressings, uh, there would be a little tag that sticks out from the label, and the number would appear on that tag. Anyway, so this is a Tamaño U.S. recording, and this would be the original sleeve that sold with that. These sleeves also kind of shrink up uh, over time, and so they develop these creases in them. But this is in pretty nice shape. You've got really good uh, uh, gold printing still on it, and his picture is in nice shape. And there's a, a celluloid window that goes here, uh, so that when you slip the record in, it you see the label and not him. And then out of our historical section, we have... Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, June 2nd, 1953, and the original sleeve for that, which is very nice. Your ears at the coronation. Hmm. Sounds kind of corny to me. Sounds kind of weird. We do have a little tear up here at the top, but it's not too bad. All right, so those are just some of the interesting records and sleeves we have. All right, a couple of... Uh, oddball labels I just put pulled out. Um, your very first Victor recordings, instead of having the dog and the phonograph, had what we uh, know as the lease notice at the top. This record is, is leased, not sold. And uh, your very first ones will say Eldridge Johnson here, and then the later ones will say Victor Talking Machine. Uh, this is not the very first lease notice label that was used. The very first one would say uh, Victor 10-inch record around the top. Those are very, very rare. And we've had a few of those over the years, and they will typically sell for $1,000 on up, depending on their condition. But this is a, a very nice, we call these a pre-dog Victor. So if you ever heard the term pre-dog Victor, that's what you're going to be looking at. And here is something which is uh, just kind of cool. Again, we have new uh, bidders and customers all the time in our uh, auctions who... Haven't been collecting for long, so I just thought it would be nice to pull this out. This is an Edison Diamond Disc. Uh, Edison Diamond Discs typically have a white and black label. This one has a gold and blue label, uh, indicating that this is an Edison Long Play. So your Edison Long Play records, instead of having 150 threads per inch, which is the uh, uh, 
number of grooves per inch on the, the recording, uh, your long plays are 450 threads per inch, which is extremely fine. That's finer than a modern day LP. And as a result, these records, this 10 inch record will play a grand total of 24 minutes. A 12 inch long play record will play 40 minutes, which is longer than your typical LP as well. These were way ahead of their time. They came out in 1926. Uh, there were only 14 issues uh, released eight of them 10 inch, six of them 12 inch, and then uh, Edison shot it down because the machines that were made to play these things quickly chewed them up. So uh, the, the recording technology was, uh, was, was more advanced than the reproducing technology. But um, really, really neat uh, historical recorded sound artifact. All right, now we're gonna go into the Uh, label sections. So we're going to start here with uh, our 10 inch records and every catalog has a section of uncommon 10 inch American uh, labels and uh, this particular catalog well, like last one also has a uh, category for foreign labels. This is actually a foreign label even though it's in the American uh, category because it is uh, American Masters and everything, and it is, uh, uh, and it was released in the United States as well. But this, but Ajax was actually a Canadian label. All right, so we're just going to flip through these. Not necessarily a lot of commentary. Apollo, that, that may be hard to see, depending. On, you got a good image of that. Okay, okay. so that's an early banner, Leeds and Catlin pressing, Bell. We talked about black swans in uh, the previous uh, auction video. This is nice because this is uh, James P. Johnson's very first piano solo on record. So black, black swan, or red, which was typically used for their operatic series. Another black one, blue label Broadway, usually they're black. This is their very first cardinal label style. Carnival is pre-label, one of several, several different Clarion varieties. I'm flipping through these pretty fast, but I know that you guys have a pause button on the video, and if you want to see something, you can just stop it. So we're going to keep going through them. Claxtonola. This is an interesting uh, label. Uh, it's kind of a scarce label anyway, but you might be able to see here it says January 1921 stamped on it. And if we flip it over, we get a little bit more information. We have another January 21 here, and January 21 here, and then we have a Philip B. Lewis name. Uh, Philip B. up here without the Lewis part. I don't know what this guy was doing with his stamper, but, um, you know, you figure it out. I got an uh, email on that record just today, a guy asking for more information about those, uh, those rubber stamps. Uh, Dandy, rabbit hop on it whole series of uh, Edison needle cuts. Edison uh, produced the diamond disc records. I'll just show one of those briefly here. For those of you who haven't seen one before, this is an Edison diamond disc, as I mentioned earlier, with a white and black label. So these would be comparable to a 78, except for the fact that they play 80 RPM. And also because they, they're also different because they are vertically recorded. So instead of moving your needle side to side as it tracks the groove, it moves the needle up and down. So you would not be able to play this record on your phonograph or your turntable unless you had a special setup designed to reproduce a vertical groove. And the Edison long play that I showed earlier is also a vertical recording. And so you wouldn't be able to play that either. And you would, even if you did have an, uh, an Edison long play machine, you would not want to put a uh, long play uh, record on it because it would rip it up. All right, so Edison finally came out with a normal 78 like everybody else just before he uh, shut down his phonograph division. And these uh, typically are pop, uh, it's pop music that he put on those, but there was also a country uh, series as well. Okay. Here's an Electra disc. This was pressed by uh, RCA Victor. A 
a new Electro Beam Jeanette. This particular label variety right here was uh, kind of used, if not stolen, by various labels in Australia, as we will see uh, shortly. There's a green Jeanette. Globe came in several different colors. There's Gospel Trumpet Company, Harmograph. Helvetia, or Helvetia, however that's pronounced, is a uh, label featuring Swiss music. Uh, this label and El Janola, which is an 8-inch vertical uh, record, are the labels which are absolutely, absolutely the worst in terms of the pigment running if you get it wet. You can see a little bit of that here, where, the, where it's just maybe just picked up humidity from the air over time, and you can see a little pink around these labels, or the letters. But if you get this thing wet, or you wipe it with a damp rag, you're going to be sorry that you did that. Fortunately, all the records that we sell in the auctions are already washed, so you don't really need to worry about that. That's right. And our record washers are very carefully instructed on which labels not to get wet. Mm -hmm. You don't do that with V-discs. You don't do that with a lot of 16-inch uh, radio transcriptions and so forth. And there is a nice uh, Leeds and Catlin Imperial record label. Very attractive. Okay. Here we've got Jewel Kalamazoo. There is a machine actually called the uh, Duplex Kalamazoo Duplex Phonograph, which has two horns on it, just like that. I've had a, two or three of those over the years. Very rare machines, and the, uh, the records are desirable just because Kalamazoo uh, machine collector, duplex machine collectors uh, like to have records to go with them. Not that the, re not that the machine played uh, any different sort of record. It was the same type of 78. In fact, uh, this particular Kalamazoo record is a Columbia pressing. It would have appeared with a Columbia label uh, as well. But, uh, so it's not a specific record for that specific machine but they are desirable. They generally will sell for $50 on up. LaBelle from 1920, there's a pretty Lyra tone. Majestic, these uh, came out in different colors. Medallion, Melva, there's a red one, here's a black one. This is a, a purple label Montgomery Ward, which you don't see all that often. Nice recording there by Paul Robeson. Music of the Orient, which was a uh, uh, typically featuring Middle Eastern recordings. New Comfort uh, was a uh, brand of phonographs. New Comfort didn't put out a whole lot of records. It was only a handful, but they never listed any uh, artist information. You don't know who that, in fact, you don't even know if it's a vocal or an instrumental. You gotta play it to find out. There's the, uh, the Nightingale Parlor Grand record. Another very nice, uh, early recording from around 1907. Okay, here we have Nordskog, California label. Started in the 1920s. And uh, these come in different uh, colors as well. And some of these are, are kind of special pressings. Nordskog was they had a pretty blurry line between what was a special pressing and what was actually meant for sale. All right, Olympics came in different colors as well. This is the uh, Fletcher Record Company uh, label. Here's uh, an Olympic with the Olympic Disc Record Company or Corporation label. Those came, as I said, in uh, blue, red, black, so forth. Here's a purple opera phone. Opera phones came in several different colors as well. Here's an uh, interesting Paramount, which is a Black Swan reissue. So you see up here, uh, it says Black Swan Record with a Black Swan logo right there. And um, in, uh, underneath it, you've got the Black Swan number, formerly number 2001. That's the way the uh, Paramount Eagle would normally look, except this is an earlier variety sitting up here on top of the little... Uh, floor model uh, Paramount phonograph. Your later ones had them up on top of the globe instead. Red Paramount label. Uh, Parlophone, U.S. Parlophone label, not uh, particularly rare, but uh, when we put uh, records in a sleeve like this with a tape, 
and the cardboard backing. We usually do that when we have a record that's got a dangerous crack so it doesn't get any worse. Uh, just try and take care of those things, get them to you in good shape. There's a track of Pennington record label. There's Polk, a lot of nice rare stuff that came out on the Polk label. It's very desirable. Uh, Polonial, or Polonia, I mean, another ethnic label, U.S. Puritan. Puritans came in several different styles, so here you have an earlier label where you've got a, the fire going in the hearth and a, somebody sitting there next to it. And then now that's been replaced with America's Best Record up here at 12 o'clock. Same thing, only in red. Here's what's called the Kova QRS label, which is different from the black and gold QRS label. Not much is known about the Kova company. Is it different from the COVID one, too? Uh, that's a good question, Jack, and uh, I'm afraid I don't have an answer for that. Hmm. Uh, probably less is known about the COVID uh, QRS than the other one. This particular one is uh, recorded by Mildred Grizel, which was the first wife of uh, Ferdy Grofay, who wrote Grand Canyon Suite. The RMC label, Regal. I'm going to run across a Regal here in a little bit, uh, somewhat different from that. Rich Tone, that's a later Silver Tone label. Star, Stark, I think we've got a couple of Starks. Here's a Stark. In fact, you know what that is, don't you? That's Stark Naked. Put it back in the sleeve. Yeah, there's two kids watching this, Kurt. Come on. Sorry. Uh, here's a strong uh, label. It's a, a U.S. label. It featured uh, German material. Sunrise, the record of today. A nice gray gull. With the hits of yesterday. Yeah, gray gull, gray, label. Gray gull label. Mm -hmm. Exactly one of uh, quite a number of labels that gray gull produced. Here's a supertone. That's a Path A Perfect label. There's Symphony Record. Tremont. Here's a variety label, which uh, varieties are fairly common, but this one is a, a purple one. You don't see those as often. Vim. All right. Still awake over there, Jack? Huh? What? Huh? All right. I always call these the, the Wallen Savinska records. It just goes Robert? to show how much I know. Uh, I was talking to uh, Richard Martin of Archaea Phone Records on the uh, phone yesterday, and he's actually putting together a reissue of these right now. And he says, do you have any Valines? I said, what? Hmm. Uh, Valine labels. I said, I'm not sure what that is. Well, it turns out he's talking about this. So apparently that's the way we say that. There is a Valine Savinska record. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing Savinska right. I should have asked him about that. World. Okay, so I said we would see uh, another Regal label, and here we have it, only it's got an Amphenola paste over. So we are now uh, into the foreign labels. Oh, good good point, Jack. Yes, we are. We are into the foreign labels. It is an American Regal. Somebody's removed the label on that side, as you can see. But uh, they over-label it with Amphenola. Apparently it's English. Okay, there we go. Moving right along. So as we mentioned before, we would see some Australians filching the new Electrobeam Jeanette label. Yes, and here's a good new Electrobeam Angelus from Australia. It's pretty. Well, the new Electrobeam label is pretty, right? Regardless of who uses it. Mm -hmm. The Aerial Grand Record. Artifone Record. Beta. We had one of these in the last auction. Really cool label. Especially when it's spinning on your turntable. The Bon Marche from uh, Melbourne. We had one of those in the last catalog. All right, here's the Cameo label. Obviously, that's not an American Cameo. This is Champion, Citizen Record. Clifford with an original sleeve that's a little torn up. Just one of many, many, many different Columbia variations. 
Dia doll. It's kind of nice. Uh, dual phone. This is a machine with two reproducers. Interesting phonographs. Velvetone, Electron. Nice uh, Australian label there. Embassy, another Australian label. Impero record. This is kind of interesting. Uh, this is a, uh, a pirate recording, and uh, there's a real tip off here. They weren't terribly careful about it. Uh, sung by Monsieur Tiarufo as uh, one name, T I A R U F O, which, uh, of course, would have been actually Tia Rufo in the, uh, on an actual uh, gramophone company or uh, uh, Victor Pressing. All right. Francesco, Francico, I don't know. Globophone record. A lot of these are German pressings that were either sold in Germany or sold somewhere else around the world. Here's another somewhat uh, electrobeam looking label, again from Australia. The new electrically recorded Grassalon Grand Prix record. Australian Guardsman record. Harmonium record, that's a little bit more unusual. ISI, you can see it right up here. And here we have Il Fono Disco Italiano. Australian Kismet. Levophone. Lyrophone. Okay. Hope I'm not going too fast for you guys. Of course, there's probably only two guys left watching, Jack. Me and you. Mm. Mellow Disc. Metaphone. Musola. Here's Nicole. This is an early English label, which uh, is also not really flexible, but kind of flexible. It's kind of got a cardboard base. And, careful, uh, careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, these are kind of indestructible. And sometimes they're single-sided like this. Sometimes they're two-sided. They can be uh, different sizes as well. Opera phone, that's a Canadian label. There's a Australian Paramount. Not related to American Paramount. There's Phoenix. Oh, here we go. Uh, one of Herb Albert's big hits, Whipped Cream. Another delight. Pilot record. Formerly called Polyphone Record, with a similar label, with the Polyphone uh, woman here, hidden by the tax stamp. You'll see her on Polyphone Music Box discs. Regal Record. This is an unusual record. Rolf Winner Success, with only one S on the end of success. I guess mm -hmm. they ran out of room. You can't win them all. Interesting title, List, L-I-S-Z-T, List to the Rhapsody Rag. All right. What do we have next? Ah, the Frances Salabert. Salabert. I don't know how you, you know, this, this French stuff, it's all French to me. I know that in French, there's some kind of rule, you just... Don't pronounce every other letter or something like that. I, I, I'm not sure. But anyway. Savannah. Ideal Scala. This is a really cool label. The uh, Disco Simplex. You got a guy on a bicycle here. I guess he's delivering mail. I don't think he'd want to come pick up over here. So that's a label out of Portugal. You don't see that very often. Special record. Here's another... Uh, Electrobeam knockoff. The new Electrophonic Star. Slightly different scroll work on it, but uh, yeah, they, they are borrowing heavily. Yeah, slightly different star label too. Uh, Summit. Nice uh, brown wax recording. Yeah. Isn't that pretty? Nice shape. Or brown shellac. Right? Okay, brown shellac. I stand corrected. 
Tip Top. Usiba. Box. German label. These come in different colors and sizes as well. Very contemporary looking label for its day. The winner. The loser. Electri electrically recorded worth. All right. I'm going to back up in the catalog to a couple more things that I just thought were really cool. Here is a uh, series of records from a set published by His Master's Voice. You'll see we've got a really nice uh, Disney picture label here. Who Killed Cock Robin. And you'll see, I don't know if you can make it out on your screen or not, but this says Silly Symphonies right here. So we've got Silly Symphonies featured in this catalog in a couple of different ways. We have this series, or this set, of 10-inch uh, HMV records. Comes with a nice uh, album with it, too. It does, and as soon as I get this thing back in its sleeve, I'm going to show that album. The album is fantastic. It's not in the best shape, unfortunately, but it's still pretty, pretty neat. Mickey Mouse and Silly Symphonies. Records from the actual sound films. How about that, Jack? Wow. The actual sound films. What do they think of now? Not the fake ones. Now look at this. This is pretty cool. Yeah. Mickey Mouse presents these records to... Uh, Edmund Goner, 15 Wood Street, Bernay? Or Burnett? Bennett, Bennett, maybe? Mm -hmm. Bennett. Yeah, how about that? Is that the way you carry records around the shop? It's the way I present them to people. Oh, very nice. And then here, look at this. This is really cool. That's nice. That's, that's worth framing right there. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. Mickey and Nipper. Wow. I hope uh, Mark got a good scan of that before we let that go. Remind him to do that if he hadn't done it yet. Okay. All right, so that was a Silly Symphony situation. And now we also have another Silly Symphony situation. You guys who get the catalog have seen this on the front cover. So the U.S. Silly Symphony set was done by Victor on three different 7-inch picture discs, which this one is my favorite side, Dance of the Boogeyman. In fact, we played that on the Bitter Request show. And here we have Lully, Lullaby Land of Nowhere. It sounds like a Jazz Bo Collins tune. And what do we have here? Ah, and a little, and a silly symphony. A note in blackface. <sighs> For shame. What are they going to think of next? Mickey Mouse and Minnie's in Town. Cute. Mm-hmm. And finally, the third disc. Actually, technically not the third, but uh, one of the three, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? All of these recorded by Frank Luther. Mm -hmm. Very, very nice. Your Victor Picture Record series is very collectible. Some of them are very rare. This set is certainly not uh, common. Uh, and certainly not also given the shape that it's in. Beautifully, you can see those were just really nice. Hardly any lamination cracks or anything. Look at this. Three original sleeves that it came with, each one with the uh, record number stamped here at the top. Huh? Is that nice? Or oh, it's 226. Oh my gosh, it's 226. Wow. Look at that. Mm -hmm. And then the outer sleeve that held all of those. That is, uh, that's complete. And that is why it has what a twenty-five hundred dollar minimum bid? Uh, I'm thinking it does. It should. If it doesn't, then somebody messed up. Do, 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 do. Twenty. It's a two thousand dollar minimum bid. Two thousand. Oh, somebody's going to get a bargain. Mm -hmm. Unless somebody else bids them up. All right. This is a just a cool record out of our uh, operatic uh, section. This is a five-pointed star, which is not on a round label. It's the star, the star is the label shape itself. And it's not often that you find record labels that are not just round discs. Part of the fact is because otherwise your needles can really chew something like that up. But in this particular situation, we've got uh, Madame, uh, Mademoiselle Mathieu, who is the recording artist. And here we have her... Uh, signature in the wax right here. 
both sides. There it is here. These are Pantaphone labels. These are very, very early, around 1904, very rare. We sold a Pantaphone, uh, the same sort of label by Jean LaSalle, I believe it was, a number of years ago, which wound up, I think, bringing somewhere on the order of six or $7,000. This one has a $2,500 minimum bid, but regardless of who the artist is, they are fantastically rare. And both this one and that other one are just in gorgeous condition. As you can see, the grooves are just really, really clean. And so well recorded also. We played that on the Bitter Request show. It, uh, it'll knock you out. And then here is a, really a very nice record, which we also played on the Bitter Request show. And it is featured on the front cover. Or not the front cover, but uh, the inside cover of our auction catalog. This is a recording by uh, Jan Kubelik. Let's see if I can find the lot number on that. Hang on. Lot number 3300. Yeah, here we go. Lot 3300. It's got a $2,500 minimum bid. And uh, this particular record was recorded in 1902. This is the title, Romance, by D'Ambrosio. Private record specially made by made for Monsieur Kubelek, dedicated to Herrn H. Klinker, who was his manager at that time, or his agent, with compliments of the Gramophone and Typewriter Limited, 21 City Road, London. Isn't that nice? It's got this textured maroon sleeve with the gold printing. And the record itself is similarly fantastic. Look at that. That is a G&T red label recording, or label with, uh, with no catalog number here on it at all. There's no number on the label. There is a matrix number in the runout. And it says, made specially for Monsieur Kubelik by the Gramophone and Typewriter Limited and sister companies. So this is, this is not only a special pressing from 1902, this is the very first record, the very first master that Kubelik recorded on the, his very first trip to a recording studio. So this is the first recording he ever made, and it was not issued commercially. It was only produced as a special pressing, and we see here that this one was dedicated to his agent. Were there others? Um, I don't know. How many, how many would, th would there have been, been of something like this? Who, who can tell? But this is certainly probably his rarest. I mean, the only thing that could be rare in this would have been an unissued test pressing if you were able to find one that was uh, not uh, created in any more than, than one number. Uh, and this is probably his most expensive recording as well. So that is, that is certainly an auction highlight and would be an auction highlight in anyone's collection. Now let's look at a, another record which is just fabulous with a wonderful original sleeve. This is also from around 1902. This is a Zonophone, orange label Zonophone, 7-inch record. Orange label 10-inch records are very rare. But 7-inch records are virtually unheard of. I've had, I don't know, one or two, and that's it. Very, very rare records, and recorded by significant artists generally. And look at this one. Look at this beautiful sleeve. Here's a little uh, glass-sided Zonophone Model A down here in the corner. I mean, how wonderful is that? Beautiful, beautiful condition. That's got a $2,500 minimum bid on it. Look at the back of this thing. Wonderful back, back plate. Isn't that incredible? That's when people really took uh, manufacturing as, a, as an art form. It's like going to the uh, Smithsonian Museum on the mall in the castle and looking at these machines like lathes or drill presses or generators. 
There would have been in a factory, nobody but, you know, bottom wage workers running these things, and they're all pinstriped with painting on them and just gorgeous. Real craftsmanship. So, anyhow, kind of hate to get rid of that record, especially with a sleeve, but it's got to go, Jack. All right, we had some uh, cylinders to show as well. So uh, let's just pull one at random and see what we got here. It may have a catalog number on it. Do we have 70, 7170? 7170, Columbia 2 Minute, number 59. The Honeymoon March played by the United States Marine Band of Washington, D.C. So this is a Columbia uh, cylinder announced Washington, D.C., which may, would make this very early, around 1896. You can see there's... There's no mold on that. It's pretty clean, pretty nice. We did not play this on a bitter request show because we just didn't have time. Uh, but it sounds great. Uh, plays at 120 RPM. So you can bid on that with confidence. All right, let's look at uh, what we got here. This uh, looks like you see a. Uh, 70, lot 7173, got that? 7173, U.S. Phono Company of New Jersey, Isler's Orchestra, performing the Marguerite Waltz from Faust. So, uh, again, no mold. We have a little needle drop right there. It'll pass. You'll hear it tick. Little little scratch there. But, again, very early cylinder, really nice shape. Uh, Isler's Orchestra, Orchestra U.S., PC of New Jersey. Very nice. What is the minimum bid on that, Jack? Uh, the minimum bid on that is 250 And what was the minimum bid on the earlier one? Uh, the earlier one was 1000 Okay. Here we have a channel rim cylinder. And this one is lot number 7171. North American Phonograph Company. And this was... Pleasant Memories Waltz, played by the Gilmore Band of New York City. And the uh, we note in the BRS show, um, as well as uh, I'm sure we will talk about it here, the ORS, the original record slip with it, says first time on it, which I'll we... Uh, I'll show them that here in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll note a chip down here at the bottom. It doesn't go into the grooves. A few very small mold spots that are inconsequential. Uh, a little band here that looks like it may have been played briefly with a, uh, a worn stylus or something, although we did play this on the Bitter Request show, and I don't recall hearing that uh, that was objectionable. It, it plays fine. But I did mention on the Bitter Request show how this and one other cylinder has a channel rim on it, so you can see that kind of incised area on the edge. Originally there would have been a paper label that fit inside that, that gave the uh, information on the cylinder, the title. But uh, because these are basically wax type cylinders, uh, those labels don't stick very well and are seldom present. Here is the original slip for that that Jack was just talking about. Band selection, what does that say? Pleasant. Pleasant Memories? Pleasant Memories, yeah. Okay. That might be abbreviated a little bit. All right. And we, like I said, we couldn't really make this out. Gilmore's first looks like time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not exactly even sure what that means. Does that mean it was the first take of that particular selection or what? I do not know. So the minimum bid on that is 1500 Okay. Very, very early. That would be 1893 or four somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. And this last North American, so that was a North American cylinder. This one is as well. Again, really nice shape, no mold. There's a uh, edge flake, doesn't get into the grooves. The uh, information on this says Edison Record 870, Grand March, Germany and America by A.D. Fos. Selection played by the 23rd Regiment Bank. So what, what Jack is saying here is not just the catalog description. What he's reading are the actual announcements. So if you played this record, you would hear that stated on the record before the selection starts. So this this particular one says Edison record was eight, 870. Eight, 870. Or 870. So the catalog number of this North American cylinder is actually stated in the announcement, which was something that they that they did around the 1893, 
1894 period. And a minimum bid on that, Jackson. Minimum bid on that is $3,000. Okay. Please don't drop it. It's ama isn't it amazing something like that would have survived this long? That's just incredible. Okay, so here we have another fantastic uh, rarity in the catalog. This is a pink Lambert, and uh, phonograph and record collectors are pretty familiar with these, or at least those who are interested in cylinders are. These are early. These uh, date from around 1900. For the first, uh, I guess, uh, two or three years they were pink, and then they switched over to black, but they are indestructible. These were the first indestructible records in the United States. Now, Leo Ray had been making indestructible, indestructible records in uh, France from, I forget, 1893 or something. So, so they were he was really ahead of the game on those. But uh, but these were the first indestructible records uh, sold in the United States. And uh, your very earliest ones would have three little wedges inside this uh, this rim that would help you to guide it onto the mandrel. But uh, that was found to be a violation of a patent, and they had to remove the wedges. Anyway, uh, so usually they're, they're just very thin, no, no core, just, just the plastic or the celluloid shell. But what makes this particular uh, cylinder so, well, as far as we know, unique at this point is that this is one of the Hebrew series of cylinders. There were roughly, roughly 50, I think 48 or so, uh, Edison, or not Edison, Lambert uh, cylinders that were Hebrew recordings. Uh, actually Yiddish recordings, and these were listed in a 1903 uh, Lambert catalog, and that's really the only way we knew anything about them, but a few of them have turned up. 19, in fact, were found and reissued by Archeophone Records back in 2016. Uh, since that reissue, uh, two others have turned up, so there are a total now of 21 of these known to exist. They're all different, and this is one of those. Uh, this has not been reissued. It's one of the two that did not make it onto the CD because it wasn't known at that time. Or actually, it was known. It was in my collection, but I didn't know they were doing a CD, so it didn't didn't make it. Uh, this is a uh, vab, which uh, means a wife in Yiddish. These cylinders, this particular series of cylinders, are the very first Yiddish recordings that were sold anywhere, as far as we know. Uh, there are no uh, no other earlier known Yiddish recordings. So they are historically uh, very, very important records. And one other thing that's very interesting about this is that these are announced standard records. Instead of saying Lambert Record Company of Chicago or Lambert Records as a normal Lambert would be announced, these are announced standard record. And um, they were uh, issued by a company uh, in uh, New York it went by the standard name. I think it was Standard Phonograph Company. Is that what it says there, Jack? It probably doesn't Just even say Standard that. Record. I think. Yeah. I think it was Standard Phonograph Company, which is not related to the any other Standard Phonograph Company uh, names that would have come later. Um, and it's unknown whether these were originally issued as brown wax and then reissued as Lambert's, or if, they, if this is actually the way they were issued originally. We really don't know. But anyway, that has a $500 minimum bid. I dare say it will bring more than that. Uh, I think that that pretty well covers all the records that we wanted to discuss. Is that right, Jack? That's right. All right, so that leaves one more thing. Our good friend, uh, former ARSC president, I think two times over, Tim Brooks, has recently come out with this volume, The Blackface Minstrel Show in Mass Media. 20th Century Performances on Radio, Records, Film, and Television. So not only is this a history of blackface and minstrel uh, shows and recordings, uh, both cylinder and disc, it takes it all the way up through uh, television. Uh, it's uh, got plenty of illustrations inside, as you can see, sheet music and uh, photos and so forth, and also has a very nice discography in the appendix of all known minstrel recordings, along with uh, the individuals who are to be found on those uh, recordings. So if you're interested in uh, black Americana and uh, this sort of thing, then uh, 
Uh, you can purchase this right off of uh, our website or out of the catalog. When you submit your bids, just say that you'd like a copy of this book, and we will be glad to include it in with your winnings. Jack, is there anything else that we needed to say? Mm, just bid high, bid early, and bid often. Okay. Uh, bid high, bid early, and bid often. And I will also say this, for those of you who don't know, we have another video that we posted here on YouTube um, I don't know, two or three months ago, which is a tour of Fort Knox. And uh, Jack basically follows me around with a camera. And we start out outdoors, show the outdoor outside of the shop. We show uh, the truck that I drive around the United States in, picking up collections from you guys. And we just basically walk through the shop as if I was a phonograph record, going through all the different rooms and the processes and so forth that that record would go through before it actually wound up being packed in a box by Jack and shipped out to you. So if you're interested in seeing that, uh, it's probably on your screen right now down below, but if not, just uh, just search for Knock Virtual Tour and uh, that'll pop up and we hope that you enjoy it. And so anyway, I want to thank you guys as well, or as always, for, uh, for bidding and hanging in there throughout this video, assuming that you have. And uh, thank you, Jack, for uh, manning the camera and doing such a great job around here. At least I could do. And uh, if you haven't yet heard it, Bitter Request Show coming up on uh, uh, September 12th and 13th, which is Saturday and Sunday from 8 a.m. until midnight Sunday. And then once again, September 19th uh, and 20th, again, Saturday and Sunday, starting 8 o'clock Saturday morning, going through Sunday evening at midnight. And this time we're doing 12 hours, no bonus hours for this show. Again, we're all kind of got this whole COVID thing going on, so we've released all hours, uh, so there's not anything extra to hear when you buy the CD. Not that you shouldn't buy the CD, you should buy the CD, but there's just not going to be extra material on it. Uh, the first six hours are going to be broadcast the first weekend, the second six hours the second weekend. We hope that you enjoy that. So... Thank you very much. Get your bids in. Uh, use the online bid sheet if at all possible. We're encouraging people to do that. In fact, if you submit your bids using the online bid sheet, you will be in, entered into yet another knock drawing for $50 auction credit. So, you know, good chance of winning. Better than the lottery. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care.